Coming up in today's newscast, an IDF soldier is tragically killed by a Palestinian sniper on the Gaza border. Israel conducts an emergency evacuation of Syrians under the cover of night. And it looks like Gal Gadot is about to go 80s style retro in the sequel to her hit blockbuster film, Wonder Woman. Tragic news over the weekend, IDF Staff Sergeant Aviv Levy, an infantry soldier in the Givati Brigade, has been killed when Palestinian snipers opened fire on Israeli troops along the Gaza border. This marks the first time that an Israeli soldier has been killed on the Gaza front since the 2014 war, Operation Protective Edge, and Israel has launched a devastating retaliation on Hamas targets in retaliation to this tragic incident. For now, there is an uneasy calm, but make no mistake, this is by far the closest to war that we've been in the last four years. Prime Minister Netanyahu has offered his condolences to the family of fallen soldier Aviv Levy. Levy was 21 years old at the time of his death, and he was wearing bulletproof armor when he was struck by a bullet from a Palestinian sniper, and initially only considered seriously wounded. But unfortunately, his condition quickly worsened, and his health decayed too rapidly to undo the damage. As you can imagine, this death opened a chilling new reality to the quickly escalating crisis brewing on the Gaza front. IDF forces struck some 60 Hamas targets in the Strip in retaliation to the news of Staff Sergeant Levy's death. Four Palestinians, including three confirmed Hamas members, were killed in those attacks. Egypt reportedly pressured Hamas not to retaliate any further, warning the terror leaders that Israel would launch an all-out war in two hours if Hamas proceeded with escalation. This allegedly included the halting of incendiary kite and balloon attacks. Uh, في إطار العودة للتفاهمات السابقة نحن في حركة حماس والمقاومة الفلسطينية بكافة فصائلها ملتزمة بحالة الهدوء وملتزمة بما تم التفاهم عليه ولكن مصير هذه التفاهمات ستحكم عليها الأيام المقبلة من خلال سلوك الاحتلال الإسرائيلي على الأرض ولكن في النهاية من حقنا أن ندافع من حقنا أن نرد Israel has not publicly confirmed nor denied any such ceasefire deal, but regardless, it's been more than 24 hours since that deal apparently emerged, and things have been relatively calm. But with blood spilt on both sides now, the region may stand on the precipice of war like never before. United Nations Chief Antonio Guterres has demanded Hamas step back from violence to avoid such a fate. For now, time will tell if the war is indeed on the horizon. <laughs> Israel has been providing direct humanitarian aid to Syrians impacted by the civil war for years now, but nothing like this. The army has just launched an unprecedented covert operation and evacuated hundreds of Syrians from the war zone, and this includes some 800 members of the White Helmets, a volunteer group consisting of search and rescue workers who have operated in the most horrific regions of Syria over the last four years. The IDF has confirmed the evacuation, which took place under the cover of night over the weekend. Army officials have even admitted that this is something of an out-of-the-ordinary operation by Israeli standards. But with President Assad's forces pummeling southern Syria like never before, these hundreds of civil defense workers were in immediate danger. The United States and Europe collaborated together to help Israel conduct the rescue operation. Jordan has agreed to accept all 800 members of the White Helmets and their families, who will be safely relocated to the UK, Canada and Germany in the coming months. Israel's Operation Good Neighbor has seen literally tons of aid taken behind enemy lines into Syria to help families devastated by the war. Israel has even treated thousands of Syrians within Israeli territory with medical aid. But this overnight rescue is a truly unique and compelling example of Israeli humanitarian relief. The White Helmets have conducted hundreds of rescue operations in some of the deadly Syrian war zones since 2014. The group says they've saved more than 114,000 lives and lost more than 200 of their own members. Here now with more on Operation Good Neighbor is former Israeli ambassador to multiple countries, Yosef Livni. Thank you so much for coming back in. Thank you. Um, so my first question, you know, what are, what are your initial uh, you know, reactions to Operation Good Neighbor and, and should we have gone through it? Should we do more? 
I think that first of all, I think we should applaud uh, the willingness of the Israeli government or the Israeli military to provide assistance to these people who have been suffering for so long. Mm -hmm. So this is the basic premise. Sure. It's within Jewish values, it is humanitarian values, it is what proper people do. You help those who are really in dire need. And we're not talking about just the fact that, you know, they're poor people. No, they live in... in uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, in, in, in that sense, I think that any help we can provide, be it uh, through medical you know, assistance, people were taken to hospitals, were operated on, etc. I think all these things should be applauded. I think it's, it's a great initiative. Now, of course, people will say, why do we have to go in and accompany uh, hundreds of people and uh, we yeah. could have lost soldiers? I have no doubt that the people who made the decision took into consideration all the factors that surround such an operation. Mm. They would not have gone in if they thought for one moment that you were putting Israeli, the lives of Israeli soldier in real danger, I see. in you know, in harm's way, as it were. So, so okay. So, this level of involvement. I mean, you mentioned uh, aid that we send over the border, uh, Syrians that we've brought into Israel to say to Ziv Hospital and treated yeah. them medically, uh, and now this, uh, which we took them to Jordan. So, should Israel be more involved in Syria? I don't think so. I don't think that we should, you know, make uh, uh, commitments mm -hmm. that do not take into consideration the changing realities on the ground. Mm -hmm. I think that what, where we can do something to alleviate the sufferings of people, we should do it. Okay. There's got to be a point where you say, okay, I'm not going to go beyond this point because it's going to put the lives of Israelis in, high, in danger. So no, you don't go and you don't do this. Otherwise, I mean, providing tents, providing blankets, providing food, water, whatever, sure. I think, yes, we should go on. So, okay, I, going back again to uh, different aid programs that Israel has, has been uh, pursuing, uh, while I agree that Israel has done a tremendous amount, uh, recently, we saw a report of you know dozens, if not hundreds, of, of uh, Syrians coming towards the border in the Golan and then being turned away. Um, why do you think Israel really behaved that way in that instance? They say it was because they were approaching a minefield, but that was not confirmed. I think that it has been our policy all along mm -hmm. uh, not to open the borders to influx of, of refugees, be they Syrians or whatever. Mm. I think that we should continue with proactive approach, namely providing assistance close to our border. Mm. I think that the Syrians, and again, this is a, a pure uh, speculation on my part, sure. but I would tend to think that the Syrian authorities, namely the army, the Assad's mm -hmm. regime, understand that there are certain things that they won't be able to do a lot, uh, so close to the Israeli border. Mm -hmm. I don't know that Israel will... But there's a limit before yeah, Israel a, does get exactly, involved. Exactly, exactly. I, I don't think that we will sit there and just, you sure. know, look the other way if massacres took place uh, alongside yeah. our border. All right, well, Ambassador Livnit, thank you so much for coming in uh, mm -hmm. and joining us again program. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Now, thousands of Israelis all over the country have taken to the streets like never before. In a massive nationwide all-day demonstration, the masses are protesting the recent passage of a law extending surrogacy rights to single women. The issue here, however, is that the government struck down an amendment which would have granted the same right to men, a move that's widely seen as a scathing attack on same-sex rights and the country's LGBTQ plus community in general. LTV's Brett Allen Smith is here with more. Brett? Hi, Aaron. Thank you. So, yeah, this is really one of the biggest, more organized protests that we've seen here in quite some time. It first came together late last week when the surrogacy bill passed into law, and the big surprise there was that just days before that, 
Prime Minister Netanyahu did promise to support the extension of same-sex rights to that bill for, for same-sex couples. He actually, there's a video of him saying that on his Facebook. It's still up, I believe. But a few days later, Netanyahu pulled a big 180 and actually voted against the LGBTQ community, passing the bill that excludes single men altogether from the tax. Needless to say, a lot of the people felt very betrayed, maybe we can say, and I think that's why we're seeing so much outrage right now in the streets. All right, and so how big of a scale are we talking about this protest? Uh, huge. I mean, it's huge. I don't know if you can see the pictures, but I mean, sure. the protests formally began at 10 a.m. this morning. Mobs of protesters blocked major highways around, in and around cities. We saw this happening, you know, in Tel Aviv, Haifa, even the more religiously conservative Jerusalem. And rallies continued all the way until 8.30 p.m. tonight. That's, that's 10 hours of protesting. Wow. And I think something like 40 companies actually gave their employees the day off to support their decision to participate in this demonstration. The local branches of Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, you name wow. it. So this really feels like almost like a nationwide event, I would say. All right, well, I understand that you know some of those companies are also even taking it a step further. They're actually saying that they'll help finance circuses for their employees who yep. identify as LGBTQ+, plus, uh, despite this law, correct? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I mean, as much as 10 or even 20 grand towards a surrogacy procedure, I mean, for some, the passage of this law really comes at a time when the rest of the world is, you know, becoming more um, progressive, advancing more towards equality. Um, Israel has often advertised itself as one of the only places where people who identify as gay, lesbian, or transgender can safely live and love in freedom. And I think that's why you see so much so much uh, pain when, when that PR doesn't translate back into actual equality laws and civil rights. And I think this individual sums it up pretty well. Watch this. Uh, I think the LGBTQ community in Israel has had enough. We feel that we are being used. We feel that the issue of LGBT and equality for LGBT people isn't something you can only flag around the world. You have to prove that you have uh, behind it results. And we want results. And this is the time to get real equality in the matter of children, and, uh, creating families, and getting married. And this is what we're doing today, putting our uh, voice very loud, as loud as we can. And that, and that sums it up. Yeah. All right. So now Netanyahu has promised a separate bill to address same-sex surrogacy, but the Knesset summer session closes in just a few weeks, meaning it'll be months before a draft is actually written, months more, more to get time. it through committee, and months beyond that to even get right, it to the first vote. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like this Makes could sense. easily be another year until we actually see something substantial. But with these protests running as huge as they are, maybe it'll turn the right heads in the Knesset. Um, at yeah. any rate, thanks for the update, Brett. Of course. Each year, thousands of young Jewish adults travel to Israel on birthright, the free 10-day trip to experience the wonders of the Jewish state. But for the immediate future, participants will not be traveling near Israel's southern borders. Birthright is now telling trip providers to change their itineraries due to safety concerns over a potential war with Gaza. Birthright is once again responding quickly to an increasingly tense security situation, as it usually does. This time, as Hamas continues to send burning kites and balloons into Israel from the Gaza Strip, Taglit is not taking any chances. The organization just told its trip vendors to avoid areas in the south, meaning participants likely will not get to see the areas surrounding the Gaza Strip, such as Ashdod, Sterot, and local kibbutzim. Until now, Birthright was allowing trips to continue visiting the south, but not anymore. Israel's education ministry, the police, and the IDF each play a role in approving itineraries for birthright trips, and safety is the number one concern for the 18-year-old program. Further, this is not the first time birthright has instructed groups to change itineraries. During Operation Protective Edge in 2014, groups were barred from traveling to the majority of southern Israel, and it even dropped Tel Aviv from some trips as Hamas launched rockets towards the popular city. This latest move, however, also comes as a group of participants just created a GoFundMe crowdfunding page to raise $10,000 after walking off of a birthright trip to join the activist group, if not now. The group of eight from two separate birthright trips were given a tour of the West Bank's city of Hebron to learn about the occupation, and the GoFundMe account raised the requested $10,000 and then some within just two days, requesting donors pay for their flights home, a cover for the $250 deposit that they will not get back from Birthright, and for the pending legal fees that they might need should Taglit sue them. That being said, Birthright says it does not intend to sue at this time. Moving on, skin. It's important to keep it healthy. But what's the best way to keep your skin looking rejuvenated? Chava Zingboim, the CEO and co-founder of Chava Zingboim Cosmeceuticals, has the answer. Thank you so much for coming in today. Hi, thank you for having me. So tell me a little bit about Prophecy 2. Okay, well, Prophecy 2 is all about hyaluronic acid. We all have hyaluronic acid naturally in our skin. Mm -hmm. This is where our skin produces hyaluronic acid in a natural way. It plumps the skin, it keeps us 
young looking and wrinkle free. But as we age, we have less and less hyaluronic acid naturally occurring. And so it, uh, less water, I it observes right? less okay. water, our skin looks less uh, young and less yeah. vibrant. And we all want more and more hyaluronic acid in our skin. So for many years, doctors and researchers looking for methodologies this. to introduce sure. uh, hyaluronic acid back into our skin. So far, the only way to do it was via injections. Okay. Because hyaluronic acid is a large molecule that cannot penetrate the skin any other way. That was right until prophecy uh, came along. And um, I received, seven years ago, I received a phone call from uh, Professor Lubert from the University, Barilan University, mm -hmm. the nanotechnology department, oh. who told me we've managed to micronize the hyaluronic acid molecule and we want to try to uh, find a, a base cream, a cosmeceutical company who can sure. create a cream so we can introduce hyaluronic acid into the skin uh, via a, a cream and no injections. That's so okay. that's, uh, that's a big news and it's a, a great thing uh, came from the Bar Ilan sure. University. So, okay, so, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have, two, so I have two major questions. The first is, is there such a thing as too much of a good thing with hyaluronic acid? Uh, and second of all, um, you know, how, how did you go about the actual development of infusing it into a cream? Okay, so uh, no, you can't have too much of hyaluronic acid into the skin. And uh, we need, as we age, more and more hyaluronic acid. We mm -hmm. want that for the plumpness of the skin, sure. the, the, um, the skin looks younger, and for the health of the skin, mm -hmm. okay? It protects us from dryness. So it is also for beauty, but for all, for health sure. as well. And uh, we've managed, it took us seven years, to uh, come along with that special cream that incorporate the technology wow. in it so it can actually, um, um, it can actually work as a, a penetrating uh, methodology to introduce the hyaluronic acid deeper into the skin. All right, well, I, I'm, I'm sorry we have to cut it off and it's cut okay. it short, but, uh, but I understand it's available now it in available, Israel. Yes. It's going to be available in the States soon now True. that you have FDA uh, approval and all that. Chavez, thank you so much for coming thank in. Thank you. I'm very excited My for pleasure. this product. All right, now the International Judo Federation has just made a very telling example out of the two nations that have consistently discriminated against Israeli athletes. The United Arab Emirates and Tunisia have now officially been stripped of their hosting duties for two international tournaments, a move that Israeli ministers hope will set a clear precedent for any countries that exclude Israelis from future sporting events. Both the UAE and Tunisia have a long history of either banning Israeli athletes from competitions or else refusing to allow Israeli symbols at their events. This has played out many times, especially in the world of judo, where Israeli athletes are among the best in the world. Officials from the International Judo Federation have often scolded organizers for such behavior, but this is the first time that a significant punishment has been leveraged to actually deter it. Tunisia, however, has actually just refused to allow an Israeli athlete to compete in another sporting field, the World Chess Championship. Unfortunately, the victim here is a seven-year-old girl, Liel Levitan. Little Liel took home the gold at the European Chess Championships earlier this month, scoring her a top spot in the World Championship. But now, tragically, she won't even get a chance to compete at all. Tunisia has refused to allow Liel to compete simply because she's Israeli. Liel has been invited to compete at an alternative championship instead, which will take place in Israel. But obviously, this isn't exactly the same thing. We can only imagine how disappointed this little girl must be, and we can only hope that the situation can be fixed and that sports will build future bridges rather than tear them down. At this point, what would one of our main newscasts be without a little Wonder Woman drama to go along with it? Well, this time Gal Gadot and the Wonder Woman team took to Comic-Con in San Diego to tell us all they could about the sequel, and ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here with the details. Emmanuel. Well, Aaron, I wish there were more details to discuss, mm -hmm. but according to the movie's director, Patty Jenkins, there are just three and a half weeks into shooting the Wonder Woman 1984 film. Uh, they have another 20 weeks left until it shall be completed. It's apparently not a legit mm. sequel, actually. Jenkins yeah. said it's just a different chapter and a whole new movie. She's loving the characters and wanted to create an amazing movie, new movie, not really based on the first one. Okay, so wait, it's not it's not related at all to the first film. It's just a new storyline right. with, right. with Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. Exactly. Okay, so uh, you know, 
what, what, what can you tell us about the trailer? So everyone's being extra careful to keep things under wraps, especially with the fact that the movie is just in the early stages of being filmed. So the trailer, you could call it, is pretty brief, according to the reports. Gal Gadot jumps into a very 80s-type white mall, and of course, right off the bat, there's intense drama and showing off what woman, Wonder Woman can do, you know, casually capturing the men that are shooting at her while jumping through the mall, and then casually. slowly the Wonder Woman 1984 title comes up. All right, well, I'm sure we're going to be very pleased with the full trailer, which uh, I'm sure won't be coming out for the next couple right. of weeks at least. But what about the characters? So everyone's really excited and, and confused, but more excited about the fact that Chris Pines will be back for the second movie. And as a right. new addition, as we spoke about, Kristen Wiggs will be playing the villain, the cheetah, which I literally can't wait to see. I'm used to seeing her in funny Kristen movies, TV Wiggs shows. Is the cheetah. Cool. Right. So this is going to be great, especially alongside um, Gal Gadot. It's going to be absolutely epic. All right, now I know it's it's a bit early, but when is Wonder Woman 1984 set for release then? It's been reported that the movie hits theaters on November 1st, 2019, so we have a long, long time to get excited for it. All right, then I guess we'll have to bring you back in uh, when we get a little bit more updates on the movie. Um, thanks for joining us for now, though. Thank you. All right, now if you've ever been to Germany in the winter, then you already know how cold it can get. Well, that's why Germany will probably be freaking out over this next bit of news. Lufthansa Airlines has just announced new direct flights to Israel's southern resort city of Eilat. With warm skies and crisp beaches literally every day of the year, it's quite the destination getaway. This is more good news for an already historic week for the city of Eilat. Days ago, Israeli officials and ministers witnessed the first commercial flight landing at the new Ramon International Airport. The facilities, which will be open by March of next year, will be able to accommodate over 2 million visitors annually. That's roughly the same figure that Israel's tourism industry is hoping to receive over the entire coming year. The city of Eilat is located on the tip of the Red Sea, sharing a border and a view with Jordan. In addition to being a gorgeous vacation getaway, the city is also tax-free. So yeah, it's a bit out of the way, but trust me, Eilat is a worthy addition to any vacation schedule. German's Lufthansa Airlines will commence direct flights this October, and maybe it's no accident that this is pretty much one of the coldest months of the German year. For now, though, the airline will start off with just four flights a week, and I wouldn't be surprised if those seats sell out really quickly. For the first time ever, an Israeli photographer has just been named top dog in the British Kennel Club's Dog Photographer of the Year competition. As you probably already guessed, the competition spotlights some of the absolute best dog photography in the world, so prepare yourself now for cuteness overload as we show you some of the most cuddly and adorable photos you'll see all day at least. Eleanor Roisman took home the first place trophy in the Dogs at Play category. And yeah, you guessed it, this category is devoted to snapshots of man's best friend just playing around and having a ball. Doesn't get much cuter than that. The British Kennel Club has been running this competition for 13 years now, and this year more than 10,000 pet pictures were submitted from some 70 different countries. But this year's award marked the first time that an Israeli photographer won the gold. Eleanor Roisman is 27 years old and is originally from the Israeli town of Ashkelon. She started a pet photography business three years ago called Dogma Photography in Israel. And probably about 90% of the photo industry revolves around the wedding scene, but Roisman decided to take the road less traveled and dedicate her business to her number one passion, pets. She's the proud owner of two dogs, a horse, a parrot, and two cats herself, and she's even a certified dog trainer too. So no wonder she gets such amazing results in her work. And here's the photo that won her the gold, an incredible moment with a playful Pomeranian jumping with a soap bubble. Oisman will now head to London this September to claim her prize and to see her winning photo on display at the Kennel Club Art Gallery. I can't wait because it sounds like the most adorable art show on planet Earth. The Hebrew Word of the Day is brought to you by IDC Samru Ulpan, open to everyone. And now for our Hebrew Word of the Day. Right now, thousands of Israelis are taking part in one of the country's biggest protests in recent memory because they say a new law isn't fair to members of the LGBTQ community. And that's why today's word is hogen, which means fair. As they say, hogen ze hogen, fair is fair. If you want to be a good leader or even a good friend, lead by example and always be hogen. Nothing destroys trust faster than doing something that isn't so hogen. So remember the golden rule and do unto others as you'd like them to do to you. And that's the best way to figure out what's Hogen and what isn't. Now let's go ahead and take a, look, take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear and warm with a low of 79 or 26 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow should be partly cloudy but with little to no change in, in temperatures. And the high should sit around 88 or 31 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.65 shekels to the American dollar. 
Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you for watching.